everybody, and welcome back to Practice Makes Faithful. Today, we are in Season 2, Episode 14. My name is Ben Patterson. I'm joined by Paul Hubert. Yeah, here we are. Uh, episode 14-ish, right? 14, of yes, that's two. it. So we're rolling right along. Just finished uh, a series here this last week. So, yes, we did. So that's good. We are actually filming today on Election Day. Yes. Um, special day, and that'll kind of give a little special preview to our topic we're going to discuss today yeah. because we are doing something different for this month. For the month of November, on our Sunday mornings, we are in a series called The Simple Message of First John. And it's a really cool concept. Paul, you want to just tell them what we're doing during that series? Yeah, so um, so where we are here at Grace Chapel, for those who are connected with, uh, with our church community, uh, you're probably aware of this. For those who aren't, I'll just give you a quick insight. Um, we, we have set the target of becoming a, a community of disciples who make disciples. I mean, we want that to be true about who we are, true about our cultural identity here. And, you know, as, as it relates to that, we know that a lot of what we do will stay the same. We're still a church that gathers on Sunday mornings, gets together, values the thing we do on Sunday mornings. But we don't view that as, you know, even anymore really our primary entry point as the beginning on-ramp for a relationship mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. We're looking to be as we go out and we are the church and have these conversations, these disciple, discipling relationships that are formed, that is the on-ramp for how somebody comes to know God is, is as we go. Yeah. Uh, which is really, you know, that's the intention that, that Jesus had is when he gave the Great Commission. As you go, everywhere you go, uh, make, you know, make disciples, uh, teach them to obey, baptize, you know, all that. Um, you know, that's the intent of Jesus. And so we are trying this month to model um, an organized tool for how we might have those conversations. And some okay. will call that the discovery approach. Some call it discovery Bible study. Some call that three-thirds method. The idea basically is, you know, we're gathering around a particular text of Scripture um, and we're asking several really important questions. You know, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about, about people? How can we be faithful to what we've learned and how might we share what we've learned as we've just engaged with this text? And so for the whole month of November, we're having just four, four people on stage having one of those discovery conversations, walking through a passage, seeing what we discover and how we can be faithful then to what we've, or faithful to and with what we've discovered um, in, in learning as God reveals himself through, through the word. You know, believing, um, you know, that, as Hebrews 4.12 says that, you know, God's word is alive and active. You know, so it doesn't require, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about being intentionally um, uh, maybe not uh, overly well spoken in the way he presented himself to the Corinthian church for the sake of allowing the Holy Spirit to move. Well, if we believe that the Holy Spirit works through the scriptures, the active word, and is, is living, that the word is living and active, then we want to allow those conversations and the Holy Spirit's movement through them to be the catalyst for disciple making instead of, you know, any really wise and clever words we could have. Um, and so for this that's month, good. that's what that's we're really trying good. to model. Yeah. So because of that format, it, well, first off, it is really cool. It's really cool just doing this on Sunday morning. So we would really encourage you, invite you to go and check that out. Check out our sermons this month. It's an awesome way to go through the book of First John, but then really yeah. just to model this. If you're looking for a simple, effective way to mm -hmm. disciple your friends, your neighbors, uh, people in your life, you've got someone that you think might be interested in this. Mm -hmm. Like this is an awesome way to be able to model this approach from the stage. Yeah. But because that's a very different approach, we're not doing like a real, like an actual sermon during this month. Yes. We decided we'd do something a little bit different with the podcast. Right. So each week this month, we'll take a week off on Thanksgiving week, but then we'll have three weeks of special episodes mm -hmm. where we're going to be covering some different articles, a few different topics that we'd love to dive into here. Yeah. And that brings us to today. As we are shooting this on Election Day, we are going to be discussing a article that Paul wrote for Renew.org called The Five Principles for Christian Interaction with the Political World. So, Paul, you want to tell us why did you write this article? Yeah. Like, this is going to be good. <laughs> well, I think first because I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment, right? And I like to wait for the <laughs> I mean, topics where you're going to get beat up by people. We're diving into uh, politics. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a clickbait specialist. <laughs> so, 
Um, yeah, all, all joking aside, um, I'll just be so honest to say I have been really disturbed by the level of the tone and rhetoric that exists in the political world in yeah. the last, um, I mean, really probably the last couple decades, but certainly the past decade primarily. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've been discouraged by the way that we as Christ followers get caught up in, you know, it's, it's the old saying, and I, you know, um, you know, one of, one of the, the, the first preacher I ever worked with one time, we were talking about something where I was really frustrated with what somebody had done to me and the way I kind of wanted to respond to them. And you know, that was the first time I ever heard, and it you know, makes sense because this sounds like a very West Virginia saying. Um, <laughs> But he said, you know, if you want to get down with the pigs, don't be surprised when you get walk away covered with mud, you know. Um, but that's kind of been the way that the political world has, has been the last few yeah. years. And when we engage with it, with it too deeply, we as Christ followers uh, have come up covered in the same dirt that I think others have been covered in. And, yeah. and in a way that, that it has, I think, First, done damage to the witness of Christ in in the broader culture mm -hmm. in, in a way that I'm you know that I've been brokenhearted by, and so I felt that I wanted to try to speak into that into that piece of it first. But second, over the last several years, I've received question after question after question, you know, as a church leader um, from people who want to know. How in the world are we supposed to engage with politics when it seems like it is just so dirty, you know, at this point in time? It, it is, there's so much ugliness there. Should we just abstain altogether? And so, you know, in, in our heritage, the Restoration Movement, of course, a lot of people are familiar with David Lipscomb. And that is what David Lipscomb believed, that we shouldn't have anything to do with politics whatsoever that not only should a Christian not hold political office, but we probably shouldn't even vote. I mean, Lipscomb went back and forth on that last one at times, it seems like, but I think that's where he landed, um, you know, and, and believed that through the rest of his life, that we should not have any engagement in politics whatsoever, even to the point of, of not voting, that we should just abstain from that. Um, but a lot of people still believe today as, as though, you know, Choosing to engage in politics or disengage in politics, it, it has an effect on society and culture around us. You know, there's no doubt that politics um, are the expression often of what's coming out of culture. You know, as, as uh, I, you know, Andrew Breitbart had said, um, you know, a number of years ago, whether you agreed with his overall perspective on things or not, I think he was correct when he said that politics exists downstream of culture. Um, you know, so here you have what's happening in the culture. The politics often flow out of that. Um, but because we don't often see politics as existing downstream of culture, we hope that politics exists upstream of culture. We're going to put in place legislation that's going to come and, and shape culture. That's the hope that we have. And so we believe that we ought to continue to engage in politics to shape culture or to shape um, maybe what is uh, lived out moral behavior at times. And so we're drawn into their feeling like we have that civic duty to engage at that level. And I would agree. I do think, you know, I, you know to be clear, as even we get going, I'm not, uh, even with the article, the title of the article, I'm, I'm, it's called Five Principles for Christian Interaction with the Political World. Yeah. Not five principles for disengagement. <laughs> yeah. It's actually yeah. five principles for interaction. So I believe we ought to be politically engaged um, and connected, but I believe the way we go about that as Christians matters a whole lot. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, so out good. of that, you know, uh, shared these five principles that, that I believe um, could shape um, the, way, the way that we engage. And so here's, here's the reason for principles real quick too, and I just I wanna read, um, I wanna read directly from the article. Um, yeah, I think as we go through, you know, one thing I've noticed is people have come to me with their questions is that they're often looking for answers. Yeah. I mean, they like to know. They like for me to tell them, um, here's how you should respond to this particular thing, or here's this obviously very flawed candidate who agrees, you know, who, uh, whose policies I may align with. 
tell me I should go and vote for the policies and not the candidate, or tell me I should not vote for the candidate because yeah. of the person, and even if I agree with the policies, I need to abstain, tell me exactly what I should do. And um, what I've had to be honest about in, in humility is I don't have that kind of answer for you. Um, you know, so, so what I say in the, in the article is when, when we can't find definite answers, what we should do instead is search for guiding principles, right? So here, here's the reason why. So this is quoting directly from, from the article. Answers are often focused on solving a problem. So if you satisfactorily answer the question, then you've resolved the issue. People are looking for resolution. Nobody wants to live inside of tension, right? But when it comes to our engagement in the political sphere, we often can't find those answers that just remove the tension okay. because we're dealing with people and we're dealing with policies that are complex attempts to answer complex problems, Yeah. right? So there could be different opinions on, on what is right or wrong. So this is why I point toward principles and say, principles, however, are what we employ as we try to navigate our, our navigate our way through an ongoing problem or issue. As it relates to politics, we should acknowledge that the question of how to engage is not one that can be neatly resolved, but one in which one which we need to navigate wisely. So we must navigate wisely. And so that's good. You know, that's the that's the reason for principles is if we could form a template by which we learn to navigate what's complex instead of resolve what is very difficult to resolve. I think it would help us at least have some clarity about what we will do and won't do and how we will respond and won't respond. Well, I think that's a really wise approach to this, right? Because it, it is easier for us to give answers. Mm -hmm. It's easier to hear and receive answers. It'd be easier to say, vote all Republican, that's the principle, yeah. or vote all Democrat, depending on what side you're on, right. you can find a way to justify that with scripture either way. Yeah. Um, so it'd be a lot easier just to say that. And this is frankly a little messier. It's not as yes. neat as you said. It's not. And these principles, they require you to work that out in your own life, work that out with your own faith. And uh, I think it's a really wise approach to this. Yeah, and I think, you know, if we were to look, you know, if you're trying to open up scripture and find book, chapter, or verse concerning which of the two parties you ought to be supporting, you're just not going to find that. Yeah. <laughs> but again, what we can do is open up scripture and most definitely find these guiding principles yeah. Yeah. that tell us not just how to vote, but how should we relate yeah. to either party or That's good. either candidate, or if there are multiple candidates on the ballot, it, it, they guide us in how we relate to these and also the proper perspective that we should embrace and the proper place that politics ought to have That's good. Uh, in, you know, maybe our ordered priorities to some degree. Yeah. So if you're worried when you heard we're going to talk about politics, yeah. and we're going to tell you who to vote for. That's not what we're going to be doing. <laughs> And if you're but, wanting us to tell you who to vote for. Well, um, you're not getting this until the day right, after the election day, after day election, anyway. So so there it's anyhow. not going to be very helpful. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through your five principles. Yeah. Uh, this whole article, once again, I'll just give that title again. And we'll put a link to this as well. Yes. Yeah. It's called Christians in Politics, Five Principles for Christian Interaction with the Political World. It's available on Renew.org, written by Paul. So I'd love for you to check that out, read that whole thing. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the five principles one at a time. I'm going to give you that principle. And then if you can tell me what is that, we'll just talk about it a little bit. Yeah, glad to. Cool. Principle one. Choose kingdom over nation. Yeah. Well, Are you yeah. advocating for monarchy here? Like, <laughs> yeah. is that what's happening? <laughs> uh, good, good question. No, no, so we're advocating for the, the kingdom of God and, and doing exactly what Jesus told us to do, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, the reality is, is we could become the kind of people that believe that kingdom and nation are actually synonymous. They're the same thing. You know, yeah. and that, yeah. that has, there has been the temptation, especially within the history of this nation to do that, to believe that the United States is God's chosen vessel and maybe even God's chosen vessel forever. You know, and I think that in some places, I would say this about the United States, that, that as this, in, within the history of this nation, there have been times when I think God has used this nation or um, the platform of this nation to accomplish his purposes. 
sure. think that yeah. most definitely has happened. And, and even you know, when we think about kingdom growth, uh, you know, it's right for us to recognize um, whether missionaries always went about that the right way or not, that the spreading of the gospel to a lot of the global south as it exists now originated in this from this nation. Mm -hmm. So the United States was a launch pad for many global missions. Um, again, I think some practices may not always have been 100% honorable, but let's not bury that in all of the good that came out of that. And we talked about this um, maybe a couple months ago in, in recognizing that, you know, where, uh, you know, our friend Shadanke Johnson talks about, um, you know, being grateful that a century ago, um, churches were getting together in this nation and sending missionaries to Sierra Leone that planted the gospel there. Um, but, you know, Sierra Leone has reached this point where they're starting, and in other places in Africa and India and others, where they're starting to send missionaries back to the United States because we're so far from God at this yeah. point in time. Um, you know, but certainly God has used this nation as a platform for much good and things that I think that would be aligned with, with His will um, in the past century. So we're not denying that whatsoever. Um, but there is a big difference between choosing the kingdom of God and one nation as, as your priority. Let me just give a few, okay. a, a few scriptures that would illuminate that. You know, so um, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippian Christians, Philippians 3.20, says our citizenship is in heaven. Now, we might look at that, and if we don't understand the context of his writing, we might be tempted to overlook that or believe that that does not have... Um, that what Paul said to the Philippians doesn't apply to us in the same way, but it would in the sense that, you know, Philippi was an outpost of Roman society in, in a fairly barbarian area, you know. So here's this outpost of Roman society, and many Philippian Christians would take, uh, or Philippian uh, citizens would take a lot of pride in the fact that they were Roman citizens. And everything that came along with that, with sometimes emperor worship and everything else. You know, so these people that lived in Philippi who would have had an awful lot of pride in their Roman citizenship, surrounded by people who were not Roman citizens, but they were as, um, as citizens of Philippi, they were Roman citizens. Paul is saying to them, our citizenship is in heaven. So a people who took pride in their national identity Paul is reminding them that, that ultimately their citizenship is in heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's an awful lot of uh, crossover and relevance to us in, in our society today that it's very easy for us, even as Christians, to, uh, to get caught up in national pride to an unhealthy level. And, and we've talked about the distinction, many have talked about the distinction between um, a, a healthy patriotism at times and um, a nationalistic pride that takes you to the place where not only are you proud of your own national heritage, but you actually cross the line in believing that because you are here, you are better than those who are elsewhere, um, and maybe also more favored by God because of it. And uh, you know that that can get sloppy very quickly. Um, you know, I, I think. Even Jesus, as he's engaging with um, Pontius Pilate as he's on trial, says to the Roman governor, says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. And what Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not about this world order. And I would imagine that he's saying beyond that, any world order. <laughs> My kingdom is about something much bigger than any world order, you know, and so don't box me in to one people. And Jesus was Jewish and was labeled the king of the Jews. And, you know, even his disciples expected he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus is continually saying to them, think bigger, think bigger, think bigger. And I think, you know, for, for anyone who would believe or who would choose nation over kingdom, in a sense, as a Christ follower, and, and often we wouldn't think we're doing that. You know, that's, yeah. that's part of the trouble in that is, yeah. you know, yeah. we may do that without 
thinking we're actually doing yeah. that. Um, but it's good to have a self check on that every now and then to, 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 to look within ourselves and say, am I seeking first the kingdom of God? Is the nation that I live within, is it my, my mission field in a sense? Or do I think, what? yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, finish that point, finish that sentence. Yeah, so, so is my nation my mission field? So here's my opportunity or is my nation my platform for how I think I'm going to advance God's kingdom? And there's, there's a difference in, in those things for sure, especially when we're now finding ourselves in a, in a post-Christian society. I guess I wondered, like, what would you say to someone who might argue that they're seeking the kingdom, that they are, um, they are choosing the kingdom by choosing the nation, mm. like Christian nationalism? Mm -hmm. So a Christian nationalism might argue that by fighting for America, they are fighting for the kingdom. They would mm. argue they could be, I, I mean, there's almost a level of just seeing America as such this special place. This is God's nation to where... Um, yeah, I think one could see that by prioritizing their politics, by fighting for America, by voting for the right person, they're doing kingdom work. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person? Yeah, um, here's, here's what I want to do real quickly with that, too. And I'm going to borrow from another article um, that, uh, that Bobby Harrington and I wrote together. And I'm going to have to take just a minute to find this. Probably won't take okay. very long because I have a pretty good idea of where it is. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> Um, you know, as I want to support what you've just said, so this, this article, and we can link this as well, uh, is called Politics is the New Religion, um, okay. in which Bobby and I are actually cautioning people on either side of the aisle as we become involved in politics with a religious fervor or okay. with the type of devotion and dedication that only belongs to God. There, there's a whole lot of... Um, there's an awful lot of bad that can come out of that. Yeah. But I want to give real quick <laughs> yeah. um, the functional definition of Christian nationalism that I have been using that was published in this article. Uh, it's about halfway through the article if, if you're looking at this in the feed later. So here's the definition. Christian nationalism operates upon the belief that a nation should and can be saved and a people reformed as the direct result of legislative policy interventions as distinguished from and sometimes opposed to the organic and relational movement of the gospel through discipleship and personal disciple making. So, <coughs> so when we when we try to understand why why that's a bad idea, let me just say first because it won't work. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if our goal, if what the church is supposed to be about is disciple making, we're not going to make disciples through legislative policy interventions. Yeah. That's, that's not what's going to happen. And I, and I would say that's true on both sides. I've met people on the left who think we need to do this or we can't do oh, yeah, this. For sure. For because, sure. you know, so, and I've met people on the right who feel the same way. So it's, it's people on both sides of the aisle who have deeply held Christian convictions that sometimes put their faith in a policy expression of that conviction as the path by which people are going to now come to know God or we're going to bring our society uh, to a place of greater Christian or Christianized reform um, and out of that that will either continue to foster a place where um, where it makes it easier to have gospel conversations um, or at least something that has a pseudo uh, Christian look to it you know so it, it, it appears that way um, the difficulty with that again is I would say this it it's not likely to work. You know, Jesus said, go into the world, you as disciples, and you make disciples. And how do you do that? Well, it's, it's, as I say here in this definition, it's the organic and relational movement of the gospel through discipleship and personal disciple making. That's the only way that's going to happen. Um, yeah. You know, I am not, you know, I've listened to others and I've even read others who get real critical about those who are advancing, who are genuinely, I think, preaching the gospel and advancing the sake of the gospel because they hope that the more they preach it will reform a nation. Well, I'd say that maybe that's not the purest motive in preaching the gospel, but you know, I'm gonna go kind of along with Paul on this one and say, look, for whatever reason the gospel is preached, if the gospel is preached, I'm gonna rejoice in the gospel being preached. Yeah. 
You know, so on one level, if you have people who might find themselves operating within something that's a little closer to a Christian nationalist paradigm, if they're preaching the gospel because they want to see a better America, I'm, I'm not going to go beating those folks up. You know, in fact, I'll celebrate the fact that they're preaching the gospel. I would rather see, and what I think is better, is an understanding that we preach the gospel because each person matters to God and each disciple matters to God. And we want to see people come to see the love of God, not see a better nation. Yeah. So we want people reformed and transformed by the love of God, (coughs) not our primary aim is not to see a place where we'd rather live. Well, you know, which sometimes people make it that. But I think that's what's at the heart of Christian nationalism is the desire to, yes, maybe see people changed and to see this nation changed for what people believe is for the better. The trouble is there is a purer way, a more Jesus-like way to get to yeah. that. And it's by embracing not just the, the morality of Jesus, but it's embracing the message and the methodology of Jesus as it relates to disciple making. Well, that's what I was thinking on this is that what you can legislate behavior management to some extent. Yeah, you can. You can legislate a certain behavior that someone needs to do, but that that doesn't make a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. That doesn't make someone who is trying to conform their life into the image of Jesus, and that's that's not what we're about. We're not right. about behavior management. We're about discipleship. Yep. Um, so it's 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 inadequate, and it doesn't mean don't engage as we're going to keep going. Like, yeah, sure, vote yes. for vote for people and engage in that way. But that's not that's not the way we seek the kingdom. Yeah, agreed. And I think so. You use that word seek, and I'm going to jump into a passage in Jeremiah 29:7, which I think is a great model for those of us as Christ followers who are trying to understand how should we relate to a nation in which we live. Um, Understanding that no nation is the kingdom, right? So that the kingdom is the kingdom. The kingdom of God is the kingdom. Nations are nations. So we keep those separate. You know, but Jeremiah does tell the exiles, the the Jewish exiles in Babylon, he tells them, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Well, we should have that kind of a heart for our nation to be praying for the prosperity of our nation, to seek the prosperity of the place where we live, to seek the prosperity yeah. of people, to seek yeah. the good of all people. We should, we should be looking to That's do good. that, but that keeps things in proper perspective. Um, we're beginning with prayer in that as it relates to the people that surround us, as, as, you know, the surrounding nation, um, with the heart that yes, we want prosperity and goodness because that's part of what God wants as well but what we want more than anything is movement of the gospel yeah you know that people would come to know Jesus okay awesome yeah we can land principle one there let's go yeah Yeah, let's go to principle two a little over halfway in only at number two Paul we're gonna move here we go (laughs) principle two choose theology over ideology yeah first let me uh, you know as people hear those ologies, they may be somewhat confused. Do I know exactly what we're talking about? So I, yeah, in the article, I give definitions. I want to give them here as well. Okay. So theology is this. It's the study of the nature of God and religious belief. Okay, So it is starting with God. Okay. The starting point is God for the conversations that we're having. Um, ideology is this. It's a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. Okay. So what is politics at the heart of it? It's, it's trying to solve problems of human beings, of humanity. There's no doubt about that. Um, the center of a lot of that thinking often ends up being worldly wisdom. Yeah. yeah. And the reality is we can very quickly read our ideology about economics, policy, and other things into our theology when the, re- the truth is we should be operating the other way around. Okay. It should be our theology that forms our ideology, yep. not our ideology forming our theology. You know. Uh, Um, If you think about some of the American economic policy that we've had and you take it to the extreme, you have that ideology impressing itself upon theology, which you end up with this prosperity gospel, for example. Yeah. You know, the belief that um, that, yes, absolutely, we're all supposed to be rich and wealthy. And that is rooted in an understanding of um, of economics that. 
you know, that really finds its root in a deeply capitalistic society with a neoliberal, uh, with neoliberal underpinnings, or maybe, there may be a better way to say that. You know, we talked about um, classical liberalism, liberalism, yep. Yep. Yeah, we talked about all that. One thing we didn't talk about is neoliberalism, which really relates more to economic policy, which is basically this ideology that says, we believe ideologically that government ought to stay out of the economic system. There would be as few, few uh, regulations as possible on the economic system, even if businesses are doing things that are very unjust. We'd rather the government uh, be less involved in that and let the free market sort things out. Okay? Um, I don't know that if you were to pin me down and say, you know, Paul, go find free market principles in Scripture that I'd be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not against free market principles, but there are many people who embrace a belief in free market principles and hold yeah. that as dearly as they do their ideas about God. Yeah. And sometimes take their ideas about free market principles and superimpose those upon God. You know, and I mean, I've made people nervous before in a church, and it just shows. It just shows how how much of our ideology affects our theology when people become nervous the moment we start preaching Acts 2 and Acts chapter 4 and they see a way that people were selling all their possessions and the next thing you know you're being asked questions are so are you a communist you know are, are you a Marxist no I'm a preacher and I'm yeah. reading Acts 2 and 4 and yeah. I'm reflecting what happened among a people that loved each other so yeah. deeply that that was the choice they made well, I think a lot of times these ideologies are so, like, deeply ingrained in us, like, as a product of our culture. I mean, yes. you mentioned, like, the free markets. Like, that is something that just seems so normal to us. That's just the way things are done. And then, you're right, we take that ideology first. That becomes a baseline mm -hmm. that we've always grown up in. It's all we've known in our Western culture. And then we start to read that into Scripture. And right. I'm sure... If you look for that in Scripture, you might I bet you can find, find a way to manipulate it to make it say that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I think it's really, really important that theology is leading. That it, it leads, you know, again, so it is, it is, the, it is what forms... It, theology comes before ideology, you know, yeah. again. So it's through, it's through having good, correct theological understandings that we start to now form our opinions upon different ideo ideological leanings, you know? So, um, you know, one thing I talk about in the article as well is that um, some ideologies are so complex, it can be difficult to know what's actually at the heart of that ideology. You know, I have seen before ideologies which appear at the surface level to, um, to make sense um, and, and to maybe even um, maybe even have some some justification, you know, where I might be able to look at that and say, as a Christian, I could support that ideology. And I've had times where I've started to dig beneath the surface, peel back the layers of the onion, only to find out that what is at the heart of that ideology is not actually a politically or you know a particularly good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's actually maybe um, the motivation behind that ideology was was actually pretty awful, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I think we have to be really careful um, and exercise wisdom as as we sort through what is truly a very complex political system, and to make sure that we're doing self checks. Um, about what is leading or what is our starting point. So the way I say this in the article is that for those of us who follow Jesus, our starting point should always be, always be Scripture. You know, so what forms this is what I think about God and people and the people that He's created in the in, in His image. So I see people as worthy of love yeah. and, and goodness. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I'm just going to give one example, and I didn't. I kind of felt like. You know, if you're listening to this, you probably feel like, and maybe you're feeling like it too, like I was dancing around something, and I, I was. Um, you know, but even, I want to be careful in this, because I, I believe that we ought to be a nation of laws. I mean, that's how nations are built. There are laws that help keep order and help keep structure. Um, but as I think about 
the way we have used almost that as an excuse, sometimes those of us who lean religiously right, and I, if I show my cards, that's, I probably lean more to the right than I lean to the left politically be, because of some Christian convictions. Mm-hmm. And I, but I can yeah. respect somebody who leans to the other side yeah. um, because of Christian convictions. So I can say, and I'm speaking for myself and to myself, I have allowed my belief that nations need to, to have laws such as laws about borders. And I, and I agree with that still. I still believe that there's a reason we have laws um, as it relates to immigration, but I have allowed myself to view that law concerning immigration and legal status in this nation or non-legal status in this nation to take me away from a place of having compassion for people who oftentimes are, are fleeing a plight. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. And, and for me to move to the place where I might not see those people as, as image bearers. Now, I know what's behind some of the, the ideology demonizing people who are coming up from South America at times, um, seeking asylum in this nation. Um, you know, when you peel back the layers in the onion and you start to see that the reality is that there, there are Republican powers, for example, that be, um, that don't want those people here because they're afraid they're more likely to vote Democrat. Yeah. How, how, is we, how should we as Christians see that? Yeah. You know, again, I want people to follow the law, but I also need to be a person of compassion. So how can I be a person of compassion like Jesus while valuing the law, that's, that's but good. never being the kind of person that's going to demonize people who are fleeing terrible circumstances, yeah. maybe even being a person that as a Christ follower says, here's an opportunity to reach, with and, you know, reach out to and connect with a group of people that might be receptive because they're in a moment of crisis to the gospel. Yeah. But we might yeah. be moved to not engage with those people because we're just gonna view them as lawbreakers. It's, so, it's, again, very complex, Yeah. but my point is this, our theology, the way we think about God and people, ought to frame the way we even view the refugee crisis on the border, Yeah. not our ideology, I as, think as far as it's framed politically. Again, I may have gotten myself into some trouble with some folks there. But that. Well, I, I love that order because I, I did want to comment on that as well, um, of starting with theology there, mm-hmm. if we see very clearly throughout scripture there's so much of a call to yeah. care for the foreigner care for the refugee right it's 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 so so frequently throughout scripture and we start with these with these principles then we work that out in our ideology and of how that might look in our nation and it's not mm-hmm. we're not calling we're not saying a simple solution it doesn't mean open borders right. versus closed border like we're, we're not calling for a simple solution there it is a complex issue there's a lot mm-hmm. of complexity in that area but we're starting with the first level is we're prioritizing the theology we're prioritizing what god says the care the compassion for right. those people and then there's different ways that we might Correct. choose to work that out of what that looks like and i mean i've heard like both liberals and conservatives who love jesus who work that out differently that's right of what they think is the best to do to care for those people but if we're not starting from a posture of caring for genuinely that's loving right. them then we're putting our ideology above our above theology, our theology. because exactly you can't correct. get there from scripture like that's scripture right. has a message of loving those people i mean we're called to care for for the homeless for the orphans yeah. for the foreigner. Yeah. I mean, all these things are, are things we're called to in Scripture. For, so from that perspective, I could actually go and say there is a heavy theological weight that we be involved in a positive way. But again, I'll, I'm just confessing myself. I have at times been at a place where I've given myself a pass because those people are lawbreakers. Yeah. So I don't need to love them. Yeah. Right? There's no call to love. So it's an excuse. Uh, you know, that's that's a place where I can say for myself, without pointing the finger at anyone else, yeah. I allowed ideology to lead the conversation instead of theology. That's good. Appreciate you sharing that. Okay, let's go to principle number three. Yeah. Uh, choose a Christian witness over political power. Yep. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one, and it's a, <laughs> it's a tough one, too. Yeah, it is. Um, 
So here's the bottom line in this one. What I convey <coughs> about who Jesus is matters more than any political influence I could ever hold. The story that I tell with my life and by my actions about who Jesus is um, matters more than, than any political conviction I could hold, bottom line. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and again, w without, I don't want this to be a, a place of pointing fingers. Um, but I can tell you I've had countless conversations with people who are really struggling in how they feel about Christians in the church because we as Christians um, in the last election cycle seemed at times on social media in particular to be so concerned with a particular political outcome that we were willing to become ugly in the way we carried ourselves. You know, I mean, I witnessed some of the battles back and forth. Some people that I cared about deeply were involved in some of these battles back and forth. And I would struggle back and forth wondering, should I call? Should I have a conversation with? Yeah. Should I lovingly say, I'm, I'm afraid for the witness of Christ in the way we're carrying ourselves because we're so concerned about maintaining an element of political power and winning a battle in this moment that might convince somebody to come vote the way we think they ought to vote. Yeah. But in the problem, we're act, in the process, we're acting nothing like Jesus. You know, this is this is the way that, that a friend of mine uh, put it. And you know, a while back, he said, you know, the trouble is we're we're trying to fight the battles of heaven heaven with the weapons of the devil. Ooh. You know, wow. and so it doesn't work when wow. we compromise our integrity, our personal integrity to win a political battle, we're compromising our Christian witness. Yeah. So we, we cannot win the battle of heaven by picking up the weapons of the devil. I mean, we, we've got to be a different people than that. And so um, would I be willing to fight the battle the way Jesus would fight the battle instead of the way I'm tempted to fight the battle? You know, I mean, I, I will tell you, I've had conversations specifically with people who've basically just thrown up their hands and said, I'm sick of it. I'm tired. I'm not going to be a coward. So the belief is I'm not going to be a coward, which means then I'm going to say anything I want to say the way I want to say it. And, and that's the way I'm going to fight yeah. from now on forward uh, as it relates to politics. You know, I think that's based in fear, frankly, of we see this nation changing yeah. We definitely yeah. do see, and I'm, I, you know, we've talked about sure. this. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know it's the case. Culture yeah, for there sure. is a whole new level of. I wanted to say crazy, but I don't want to be unkind. There's a whole new level of confusion yeah. that is emerging, a whole new level of lostness that is express, mm. expressing itself on a daily basis. It seems sometimes. Um, so yeah, I get it, and there are times where I want to be afraid. But I know that if I act out of this place of fear, and we'll talk about this a little bit more because it ties into uh, principle <coughs> five, but if I act out of this place of fear, I'm often going to move to something, to, to uh, I'm often going to embrace actions that are not consistent with the heart of Jesus. So, you know, this is true. I, I see this in counseling often. Um, you know, whether it be grief, fear, anxiety, these other, what I would call often primary emotions. Um, you know, so something happens, so you're very sad about it. Something happens, so you're anxious about it. Something happens and it makes you afraid. Those are emotions that are, that are very vulnerable emotions. So they make you feel very vulnerable. You know, so if you feel sad, Sharing that, sharing that sadness or sitting in that sadness sometimes can make can feel like weakness. The same thing with fear. Fear feels like weakness, and you know, anxiety feels like weakness. Um, a, an emotion that feels much uh, much more solid and much more grounded at times is anger. And so, what people who don't want to deal with that primary emotion of fear or anxiety or sadness will do is often moved directly into anger because it feels like uh, a more fortified position emotionally. It's not nearly as vulnerable. Okay. So we yeah. move to anger. 
I see that just in counseling relationships with people, but I think I'm also witnessing it in the political world right now too, where um, we've seen people choose political power because they're sad, there's a lament over what they feel like they're losing. Yeah. Instead of lamenting, we move directly to anger. And that anger then expresses itself in ways that become ungodly. Yeah. People are afraid there's anxiety about what's happening. They don't want to be in that vulnerable place of feeling fear and anxiety, so they move directly to anger. Again, it feels safer, it feels less vulnerable, we're going to move to anger. And so then what you see is anger expressing itself where the truth is there's a sadness, there's a fear, there's an anxiety behind it that's not actually being expressed. We're just going straight to the, the place of anger. Um, we need to take a step back as Christ followers and say, I will, I will never act a certain way over politics. I will never act in any way over politics that could cause me to lose my Christian witness in an attempt to have some measure of power at the political level. I think at times some of the the tragic reality in that is that like those who are embracing that political power mm -hmm. they are wanting like there there is a heart at it where they want yep. this nation to be more more Christian. Yes. Right, they want it to be what they perceive to be the good old days per se. They want it to be a more Christian nation, but yeah. it's not going to work if you're using yeah. the the tools of the world of political yes. power to try to embrace the way of Jesus. Yes, that's not going to give you that result. No, it's agreed. never it's never going to get there. Like that's not what Jesus did. I never Agreed. see Jesus going through the Gospels. You don't see him use political power. And it's the, actually, you see him surrender himself. Right. Like, you see him surrender die himself. at the hand of political power is what kills him, in a sense. I mean, it, it's not going to work. You can't yeah. get Christian virtue with political power. Agreed. Yeah, and that's, I think, the key right there. We cannot... We won't see Christian virtue emerge out of the abuse of political power or out of Christian abuse of political power or out of Christian willingness to compromise the witness of Christ for the sake yeah. of achieving political power. It just won't happen. In fact, what we do is we set the next generation up for abject failure. Ooh, yeah. You know, that's what's going to happen because we've shown them a very poor way of acting yeah. and being and living. And then we're hoping that good things will come out of that. Well, all we've done is maybe left them at best with some sort of a moral framework that they're going to end up resenting because the why is completely vacant. Yeah. The hypocrisy is not lost on, on the younger generation. So, um, you know, I, I think that summarizes, um, summarizes this. I'll end this, this principle with just this quick piece right here. Sure. Um, this last sentence in this article in this section is this just to make this plea you know so that my plea is to all follow my plea to all followers of jesus is ultimately this let's never undervalue the power of true Christ christian witness even when it places us in direct opposition to political ideology and practice you know let, let's never undervalue the power of christian witness and that remember we're called to be his ambassadors above all you know again yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a spokesperson for any political party um, I am a spokesperson for Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, so I will not compromise my witness for, for anything. Yeah. Not even because of my fears, my insecurities, my sadness, my lament. Yeah. I won't do it. I'm, I'm going to continue to walk. And if that leads me to a place where I'm part of a faithful remnant as opposed to the expressed majority power holder, which is, by the way, where Christians in America have been for years. Mm -hmm. And as we watch that power and influence slip away, I get it. It's, it's a little scary sometimes. Um, but the reality is, if, if, that, if the goal was to have that kind of power and influence anyway, we'd be going about it all wrong yeah. if we compromise the Christian witness in the process. Yeah. So. Okay. Take us to principle number four. Okay. Uh, choose influence over susceptibility. Yeah. So, um, so I think most people would be able to recognize that that in many ways politics has become a team sport in the United States, and and it's not super helpful that we only have two political parties. You know, 
Um, so you have to be one thing or the other thing. Yeah. And there's really no room in between. And, you know, as I've told many people, I, I have felt truly in the last couple of decades, I have felt in many ways politically homeless. And I used to lament that. Now I kind of celebrate that because yeah. it, it makes me want the kingdom of God more. It makes me see that the kingdom of God is a thing that I should have wanted all along. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, this idea of influence over susceptibility, it really does go along with Christian witness over political power. And, it, and, and uh, what we're doing is just taking the next step and showing you what we could be on the positive side. Okay. Yep. You know, so, so we have the ability to influence um, by being Christ followers the kind of people we are by truly living a life of character, um, by being a people of integrity and character, we do have the ability to influence, uh, I think, the political scene to some degree. And, and I'm not saying that Christians ought to be without political influence. Uh, I, I'm not arguing that at all. Yeah. Um, what I am arguing is that we need to be careful um, when we hitch our wagon to very visibly to political candidates. You know, I, I can think of, and I've seen this again, I've seen this on both sides of the aisle. So I know when I say what I'm going to say, there are going to be people who think I'm pointing at potentially one particular candidate, and frankly, I'm not. Um, I, this goes both ways. But I have seen people on social media jump to the defense of a candidate where what happened or what was said was indefensible by any Christian measure whatsoever yeah you know so that you can see I'll be I'll, I'll be picking on both sides on this one you know I, I'm amazed as I you know as I watch things on television and in our state of Georgia here the ads come on and you'll often see uh, you know uh, an attack out against Herschel Walker maybe that leads and then Raphael Warnock that is second and back to back for both of these guys were attack ads that were pointing out the fact that both of these guys had been somewhat abusive as it relates to the relationship with their ex-wives. Yep. Both of these guys yep. running for Senate. And I've seen people on Facebook defending both of these guys and saying they're such wonderful people and trying to write off the fact that both of them seem to have been abusive to their one-time spouses. Yeah. I, I don't know what to yeah. do about that, you yeah. know, and it's Christian folks because most of the people that I engage with on Facebook are Christian people. And so I'm seeing this with Christian people. Um, you know, I've seen it with other political candidates too, where somebody who is a Christ follower is trying as hard as they can to defend a particular candidate. And I'm wondering why, why do we feel like we have to get out there and defend a particular candidate for something that seems to have traction and truth? Um, you know, I, I actually do go in the article and point out, and I know some people who lean right will probably be upset with this, but but I talk about this study that comes out of the Journal of Political Psychology that shows just how willing some Christians were, go, were to go along with Donald Trump um, in the 2016 election to actually revise their personal moral beliefs so that they align more closely to his, knowing that he'd been someone who'd not been a person of necessarily high moral character and high integrity and all over the place we were making excuses for this potential candidate. Now, again, I understand that some people may have felt like they were faced with an impossible choice. When it was this person or this person, and you've got to choose between the two, what are you going to do? Yeah. And I'm not decrying the fact that some people walked into the voting booth feeling like they had to hold their nose. I'm fine with that. Yeah. I got it. But that is a, there's a whole... There's a vast chasm between walking into the voting booth and feeling like I'm choosing the lesser of two evils and defending as a Christ follower a person who maybe That's I'm not able, good. I should not be defending at all. And so what I've told people about this is this, I'm fine, you can hold your nose. Go holding your nose in the voting booth, but stop holding their water. You know, okay. what I mean by that is the idea of, you know, if you think about the, the, the water boy, um, you know, we had a water boy on our basketball team when I was in high school, you know, who would, when you came down and you were sitting down 
after being being in would come and bring you water and you know you drink that water give the bottle back to the water boy the water boy would take the you know so here was this person that honestly we sometimes viewed as a servant we weren't always the nicest to the water boys right but but that's kind of how how we've become as christians sometimes we become servants to these people that we're not called to serve yeah we're called yeah. to serve jesus christ as our lord he's our lord and master we can hold our nose and maybe when you're looking at it saying, well, I, I didn't vote for the person, but I voted for the policies, fine. Then don't find yourself needing to defend the person. Yeah. You know, go do what you need to do when That's time good. comes to That's vote. Good. But don't be so tied up in this that you just look like this particular candidate's water boy. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really good. That's, that's what I was gonna ask for clarity on that of like, what do you do in that situation when it comes to the voting? But I think you really, you, you clarified that really well. That, yeah, it's, it's, it's less about how you work that out individually. You mentioned Walker and Mordock here in mm -hmm. Georgia. And many of us may have just voted for one of those two people. And however you work that out individually, that's, you can work that out. But how we're defending these people yes. of, that like we're compromising our witness we are and i mean i just think of what is at stake when we compromise our witness that we are compromising the witness of the church yep. that we're compromising the witness of jesus that like just imagine when when we're out there and we are and now i'll, I'll say this as someone who's done this yeah. and like i did this for a while when i first got into politics and when i came around to one of my my first election in 2016, mm -hmm. I was very vocal about the candidate that I mm -hmm. supported. And I was wearing the birch, I was repping it on social media, I was trying to convince everyone to vote for him, and I guess I just showed my, I showed my hand. Yeah, but yeah. now I think back to that and I think, what did I do to my witness as a Christian? Of like yeah. what other people, what people who aren't work Christians, who were democratic who saw me and what they thought like what they thought of Jesus because of how vocal I was there and I just I don't want to engage in politics in yeah. that way anymore I'm happy yeah. to sit down and talk with someone if you want to know and if we're going to talk about politics sure but I don't want to compromise the witness of Jesus because of who I'm voting for because yeah. of a flawed person and tie that in and the next generation is watching too, yes. and they see it. And you already identified that. Yeah. And they they see the hypocrisy in that. Yeah. And I think we the bottom line really is, as Christ followers, that. we always need to be clear: we are on Team Jesus, yeah. not any yeah. team candidate, one or the other. And and there may be some candidates that arise. I hope so. The trend that we're seeing is the candidates that we see arise. We wouldn't, we wouldn't hire them to come be our, a preacher at a church. We, yeah. we wouldn't support them if they were being an elder at the church. You know, so those are the people that we ought to be able to get behind as our, our ministers, our leaders here at the church and others. Those are the people we rally behind and then Jesus yeah. Yeah. ultimately. You know, so let's, let's save our cheering and support for people who really deserve it. Yeah. Let's do what is sometimes our, yes, our civic duty, but our... Ooh, the duty we do with a turn in stomach as we walk into the voting booth, let's go do that. We need to do it. Be convicted that you're doing the right thing when you go do it, or, or maybe struggle the whole way. I don't know. I've done that too. Um, you know, here's the way I end this section to say this. You know, we're making the best of a far from perfect situation, and we ought to yeah. acknowledge that. You know, yeah. So that's the reality. What does not make sense for us is to become so susceptible to the influence of political candidate that we choose to, again, as I use that phrase, hold their water, which is a way of saying that we become their servants, yeah. or unequally yoked, which there's a biblical imperative mm -hmm. about not becoming unequally yoked or unrighteously yeah. influenced. And I think if we allow ourselves to be humble and self-reflective as Christians, Again, I don't care, you can support candidates on either side of the aisle. We've done it in both places because we've been caught up in the political fervor in a way that was unholy, ungodly yeah. at times. Okay, let's move to that fifth principle, Paul. Choose trust over panic. Yeah, um, you know, it's really funny. <laughs> I mean, I, 
I used to listen to probably political radio more than I do. In fact, I don't listen to it much at all anymore, but I did at one point in time. It was, it was entertaining and engaging and did help shape probably some of my thinking, sometimes in good ways, sometimes not in good ways. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting to hear, and I would listen to actually both sides. Um, you know, I would listen, and listen to people who probably lean more left and people who lean more right. You know, and, and so I, I mentioned this in, in the article uh, right at the beginning, and here's, here's what I start with saying this in Principle 5. Ultimately, whoever's in office, we must remember that God is on his throne. Bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. So God is on his throne. God is in charge. God is still God. It doesn't matter who is president, right? So who's ever, whoever is in office, you know, and, and I talked just real quickly about, you know, remembering um, you know, in, in 2008 when, uh, when Barack Obama was elected the first time, how many Christians really acted and believed as though the world was going to end? Now, you know, predominantly Caucasian Christians acting and believing like it's over. The nation is over. Yeah. We're not even going to be here a few years from now. Now, you could disagree about whether or not um, his time in office helped shape the direction of the country in a pos positively or negatively, and that's fine, but we're still here, right? Yeah. And then, you know, I think about... You know, eight years later, how how many Christians believed equally that we had finally reached? And I even go, you know, I use the language of Armageddon with the election of Donald Trump. Mm. You know, again, the world's going to come to an end. Yep, it's over. Forget about it. It's done. You know, Biden being elected in 2020, the sky is falling. You know, so this this alarmism every time the candidate we might not support is elected. Man, it's just not a good look for Christ followers. No. It's especially no. not a good look for Christians. Yeah. Why? Because it conveys that we do believe that we mm. that ultimately we, we can't trust God. And I know you may be sitting there saying, that's not what I think at all, and that's not how I I I don't I of course I believe that we can trust God. Okay, fine. You may believe that in that small internal place with inside your mind, that small internal voice may be saying, I still trust God. Your outward actions are speaking something loudly to others who are watching. You know, especially I, when we react that way within the church to say, this person is elected, doom is on the horizon, nothing good is ever going to happen again. And I've just seen that too many times over and over and over again. I've watched that happen. And that's not the way that the early Christians reacted at all, by the way, to people who were in power who were much worse than any political candidate we've seen in the last two decades. Well, I mean, I would just keep pointing that back to, I'm glad you mentioned it earlier, but of the next generation, of what they're seeing when we react like that. Of, yeah, you might be thinking internally that, no, I do still trust Jesus throughout this, but if you're freaking out about the mm -hmm. election, that's not what your kids are seeing. That's not what the next generation is seeing looking from the outside, looking over at the church, mm -hmm. who are becoming increasingly skeptical about the church. Mm -hmm. For often, how we're reacting in so many of these political areas, they're looking at this and they're saying, wait a minute, do you really follow Jesus or do you follow this politician because mm. it kind of looks like that politician's over Jesus when you're freaking right. out and getting hysterical about it. And uh, once again, this is probably just a way that we've yes. we've compromised to the way of the world. And it, I remember just seeing the other day, I saw an ad that came up on Instagram from uh, Joe Biden who was saying that the fate of democracy was right. at stake on Correct. this election. Correct. And this is just the rhetoric yes. of the world right now that we put all of this pressure on every election, which is ridiculous. No. That, that's what wins election. This is what gets people out to vote. And I think, I think it is a clear sign of the willingness of political leaders to manipulate the populace. Yeah. By making these outlandish, outrageous statements that, that are not true, and then we believe them, yeah. and then it shapes our actions. You know, yeah. and that's, that's yeah. even my point in this, is that you know, we're buying into the rhetoric, the ideology, the conversation that's happening, and it's not a God-centered conversation. Yeah. It's not the thing that ought to be discipling us and shaping us, but it does disciple and it does shape us yeah. so that we start living out of those things that we begin to believe the yeah. world is falling. You know, and I'm not saying that we ought well, not to look around, and here's the bottom line. Yeah then if the world is falling, God is still in charge. And if I read Revelation yeah. well, yeah. there's going to come a point in time where things do start to collapse. That will happen. 
God has promised, yeah, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so yeah. if it's part of this, God is still in charge. He's still overseeing all of this, and we need to trust Him regardless of what that means for us, regardless of what it means for our 401k or anything else that go along, goes along with it. We trust God. And our actions and the way we speak conveys that yes or no. And I think, you know, what, what boggles my mind if we understand the history within which much of the New Testament was written, especially Paul's letters, and Paul is writing to Rome, he's writing to a church in Rome um, who, who's sitting at the beginning of Nero's reign. You know, Nero let the, the Jews back into Rome after they had been uh, expelled from Rome because of the the. The, the tension that was at work between the Christians and Jews and there was rioting and it was actually a pretty bad society or a pretty bad, pretty bad time in society and to make the problem go away, they just kicked out all the Jews out of Rome. Well, Nero lets the Jews back into Rome. Paul is writing at a time when now Christians and Jews or Jewish Christians are coming back together to the church in Rome and there's actually some, some difficulty in figuring out how they navigate that now, these people that had been kicked out for a time and expelled from, from the city of Rome. Um, so, Christians have witnessed firsthand it in the time that Paul was writing and are about to witness firsthand as Nero goes, you know, halfway nutty. Um, and, and actually, I mean, halfway nutty. I mean, Nero, Nero goes completely insane. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah. he uses Christians to light the streets with their burning bodies. Yeah. You know, he uses Christians as candles. Um, you know, and it, it uses them in the arena. I mean, terrible, terrible things. And into that setting, Paul gives directions, Romans 13, for how Christians ought to engage as it relates to the authorities and the government. And he says this, he says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. It's almost like Paul felt like he had to say that twice. Yeah. There's no authority other than what God has established. The authority that exists has been established by God. And I've met Christians who've said, well, I don't believe that about that guy. Or I have no clue yeah. what God is doing. Yeah. If that is the, okay, fine. Let's be okay with not having a clue what God is doing, but trusting that he's still doing. Yeah. Trusting that he's at work, you know. So well, here, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to just say, the, and think of the witness of that. Of we, right. we spent a month talking about witness, talking about our witness. Yep. Think of the witness of the first century church who had this steadfast trust in God mm -hmm. despite this the terrible political circumstances mm -hmm. that they were living under. And then I think of us now, and I think of the witness that we could have. Mm -hmm. Imagine if, well, everyone else, whether you're on the Democratic side or Republican side, they are freaking out on either side. That's Every right. election is the fate of America. It is, everyone is freaking out, but the church, imagine if we just mm -hmm. stayed steadfast. That's imagine right. if constantly, no matter who was elected, like regardless of the results uh, of over these midterm elections, whatever, we were just, we were fine. That's right. Because we knew Jesus was in charge. We knew yep. Jesus was our king. So we weren't freaking out. And over time, after election, after election, after election, people just start to see, wait a minute, that group's acting differently. That's right. Everyone else is freaking out. Everyone else is acting like the sky is falling. But there's this one group of people that's acting differently. Yeah. And then over time, they start to ask, why are they acting so differently? Who is this that you're really following? And just the witness that that would create. And yes. right now, I think we're doing yep. a pretty sloppy job of that. And yeah. right now, because we are so often conforming to the way of the world, we're freaking yes. out the same way. But what an opportunity for us to be a witness. Exactly right. Yeah, we, we could do so much better in this. And I, that's exactly where I want to land the conversation on this principle. And you've summed it up well. I'll just read what I wrote at the end of this um, to say that in a world prone to panic. So this is casting vision for what we could look like. Christians will stand out as we choose to exemplify what trust looks, trust in God looks like in all situations. When we choose to make ourselves subject to governing authorities, even those with whom we disagree, we give testimony to our belief as to who is in charge, that God is in charge. When we join the world in panic, however, we tell an equally reverberant story. But our hope was never in a political leader anyway. Although admittedly, some are easier to follow than others, our yeah. hope has always been in God. Yeah. Our current and future citizenship lies in His kingdom and our allegiance belongs to Him no matter what comes our way. We yeah. choose trust over panic. 
You know, there's a, um, uh, we've that. talked about this guy multiple different times, a guy named Mark Sayers, who's an Australian uh, church leader, uh, has written recently a book called A Non-Anxious Presence, and the subtitle, I love this, it's How a Changing and Complex World Will Create a Remnant of Renewed Christian Leaders. And he builds the case that these leaders who embrace a non-anxious presence, not because they've achieved some level of, you know, Buddhist Zen or whatever, because they <laughs> deeply trust God. Yeah. And that God's yeah. got it. And I'm just living into faithfulness that these, that these leaders, that this new generation of Christian leaders that embrace a deep trust in God and out of that develop a non-anxious presence are going to magnetically draw people to them. In a world that becomes more complex, uh, ever more changing, ever more confusing, um, where people are more and more disillusioned all the time, what is it going to look like when you see Christian leaders who stand out there and say, I'm with God and I'm good? Even as we talked about last week, if some of us who, for standing for the things of God, end up spending some time in jail at some point in time, if that might happen, yeah. and it could happen, yeah. um, and we do that with such grace and poise and dignity, that, is, that if it, it was as if Jesus himself were sitting in that jail cell. Yeah. You don't think that's going to draw notice? Yeah. <laughs> or if we disagree with the political leader that's in charge, but we disagree with such grace and poise and dignity that it would be as if Jesus himself were disagreeing with what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Or speaking out in support of what's happening. You don't think that's going to... I mean, it's going to stand out in such contrast to what's yeah. happening in, in different places in the, in the world around us or what's happening within our society and culture right now where panic is the norm. Yep. I mean, where, you know, some have said correctly, we are addicted to outrage. Yep. What if we did something different? Because instead of being addicted to outrage, we were devoted to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that was it for us. That's good. So I, I can give, you know, just those quick five biblical principles. Again, choose kingdom over nation. Choose the theology over ideology. Choose Christian witness over political power. Choose influence over susceptibility. And choose trust over panic. Again, you never know who you're going to influence. Yeah. But don't give up your influence yeah. because of politics. Do what you do in I the name that. of Jesus. Seek first his kingdom before everything else. Awesome. Well, that is it's a great Great spot to land this content on. I know we've hit, we've hit record length for this record episode. Length. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I guess just as we close, we will still close with our regular question of how can we practice what we've talked about to be faithful to Jesus? Yeah, I, I think um, the first thing I would say is this, uh, that, that this release is actually going to be timely. I don't know if we'll know the results of the election this evening. I doubt it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. We probably won't know who, is, who controls the Senate. We probably won't know who controls the House. And you may have governor's races in your states that um, the, the outcome is not quite yet known um, tomorrow and every day forward. Act more like Jesus yeah. in relation to the world around you. Yep. Um, yeah. Don't get caught up in the mess. Don't. Don't jump in the mud with the pigs, because I guarantee you're going to come up covered in dirt too. Let us live the high road as followers of Jesus, valuing what he values first. Um, let's allow ourselves every now and then, yes, I, I lament what is happening in this nation around us. Um, I lament the eroding of some good things. And I lament the exposure of some things that are really not good in the last several years, too, that my eyes have finally been opened to. I lament that. I'm not going to go directly to anger because that's, I don't think that's what Jesus would have me to do. Yeah. I struggle with fear sometimes, too. Yeah. I'm afraid as a father of three kids. I mean, I could sit here and get emotional about that. I'm afraid of what lies ahead for my kids. I'm going to live in that space of fear and let it move me to trust in God instead of becoming angry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm anxious about the economy. I'm anxious about job security for many people. I'm, I, I am a human being. I'm anxious about those things. 
but I'm going to let that move me toward God. Not again, let it move me toward anger. When I act out of anxiety, fear, sadness, and then particularly anger, things come out of me that just as a follower of Jesus should not come out of me. When I act out of a place of trust in Him, it should go without saying it, it changes everything. And so, you know, here's how you practice this faithfully, whatever the outcome is tomorrow, whether you're rejoicing or not rejoicing or whatever. Do it with grace and poise and as if Jesus was living in your place. Mm, That's good. Um, And don't allow yourself whatever, you, you know, I mean, whatever presents itself, don't get sucked into the cesspool. Yeah. And, yeah. and for some, I may need to say this, don't get sucked into the cesspool again. Yeah. Because we've been there, some of us. Yeah. So let's not do it. Yeah. Let's truly be yeah. witnesses to Jesus Christ everywhere we go, even in the political sphere. Yeah. Even there. Excellent. That's a great spot to land it, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Thank okay. you for writing this article. I just want to remind you all again, you can access this at renew.com or renew.org I should say yes, and it's uh, Christians Christians and politics five principles for Christian interaction with the political world so highly recommend you go through read that this is one maybe more than a lot of our conversations that you need to really uh, really think through in your life because mm-hmm. these are principles they're not answers right. so we've right. given you some principles to think yes. about but you're going to have to figure out how this looks how this works out in your own life so we will link to a couple of these articles, a couple of mm-hmm. resources we've referenced today, and uh, love for you to check that out and leave us some feedback. Let us know what you thought yeah, of this. Absolutely. Uh, next week, we'll have another episode that'll be similar to this, diving into a different uh, different conversation, but um, it'll also be another one-off conversation. Yeah, we yeah. to be determined yet. Yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll figure, we'll land that out by next week. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you all again. Mm-hmm.